Good morning, Gracians. Good morning. It's so good to see all of you. For those who are joining us online, welcome. Thank you for spending your Sunday morning with us. And so um, we have also heard... Oh, thank you, worship team. Shall we give the worship team a hand? Let's give them a hand for serving. They were here very, very early. And to everyone who is also serving as well. Um, as you have heard from Pastor Larry just now, we are just a few days away from our Good Friday service. So if you haven't invited a friend for that service, we want to encourage you to bring a friend for either the Friday service or the Saturday service. And as uh, Pastor Larry mentioned just now, I just touched down from uh, Manila. I just touched down in Singapore uh, last night. And together with some Grace Kids leaders, we, we spent a week in Manila, in Tondo, ministering to children in the slums. And the team had never seen poverty like this before. Uh, it was extremely agonizing for them to be in unsanitary conditions. Uh, they were walking on dirt paths with mud, with spit, with food scraps, with trash upon trash upon trash, uh, with wastewater, frequently with um, animal dung, and even with human excrement. And I remember that when we were walking there, the sewage kind of like burst a little, and the kids were just walking on the sewage water, and after that, they got us to carry them, and everything that was on their feet went on our clothes. Now, our agony of visiting these slums for a short while, it cannot be compared to the agony that we feel for the children who are living there for generations. What is a few short hours to four generations of living in the slums? Now, when we think about agony, we think about the kind of agony that Jesus endured. It was an agony so unique that no other human beings would be able to endure that kind of agony. His agony of going to the cross was so unique, the word agony was only used once in the entire Bible. And when we look at this particular word, we will see an image of a violent struggle for victory, as if in a contest, except that in this contest, there was no way out of going to die an excruciatingly painful death on the cross. The sermon today is titled, From Agony to Victory. I'm going to be preaching from Luke chapter 22. And with this, please allow me to give you the big idea for today. Jesus submitted to the will of God despite facing agony. Jesus submitted to the will of God despite facing agony. But how did he submit to the will of God despite facing agony? We're going to be reading from verse 39 to verse 47. So please allow me to read God's word for you. And Jesus came and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them from a, about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. Verse 42, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. While he was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. In this passage, Jesus showed us the importance of prayer during trials and the role of praying in the face of testing. And as Jesus did that, he prayerfully centered himself around God's will and he found his resolve to go to the cross. Now we can see Jesus' perseverance in prayer and that allowed him to embrace being faithful and obedient to the divine will of God. But I submit this to all of us, Gracians. Maybe some of us struggle to stay faithful to what God has intended for us to do because we don't struggle or persevere enough in prayer. Now you see, if we don't even seek God, 
How can we understand or even fulfill God's will for in our lives when we face agony? Jesus' example here suggests three ways to submit to the will of God despite facing agony. So my first point for all of us this morning is to acknowledge our fears before God. To acknowledge our fears before God. You see, praying at the Mount of Olives was something that Jesus did regularly. In the previous chapter, in verse 37, Luke already established that Jesus had a habit of retreating to the Mount of Olives. Question, is praying something that we've already established in our lives? Or is it something that we have not established in our lives? Where do we go and what do we do instinctively when we face our fears? You see, when Jesus arrived at the Garden of Gethsemane, which was near the foot of Mount of Olives, he withdrew from his disciples and he prayed alone. He was about to fulfill what he had been preparing himself to do all his life. So pay attention to what Jesus did over here. We see Jesus confronting his deepest fears alone with God. Have you ever articulated your deepest fears to God? Have you ever surrendered all of its potential outcomes to God? Do we go to God first? Or do we intuitively go to other people? And we hardly ever bring our fears to God. Do we not go to God first because we don't know God? Or do we not go to God first because we don't trust God? How do you face your deepest fears? How do you respond in the face of agony? Do you have a slack and casual attitude to prayer? Or would you persevere in prayer through your times of testing? Now, this was one instance in the Bible where we see how Jesus expressed his human fear and desire to avoid suffering, which is symbolized by the word cup. We need to understand that the word cup here is a metaphor for calamity and death, for hardship and death. And, and um, so when Jesus said, remove this cup from me, he was asking God if there was another way to accomplish his will for saving humanity. You see, friends, many times our instinct, our instinctive request to God when we go through agony is, God, remove the cup. And, and Jesus asking God, to remove the cup tells us that God can accept us in our weakest and most vulnerable state. Yes, Jesus showed us that it is okay to be human and frail before God. So we don't need to fear bringing our fears to God. We don't need to fear God when we bring our fears to God. God is our safe space and being able to acknowledge our fears before God when we are in agony is precisely why we should go to God. When we bring our greatest fears before our loving Father, it is part of preparing ourselves for the coming trials. You see, the loving Father cannot go through the test for you, but the loving Father is there with you throughout your test. Amen? So God is a loving Father, and we can be open and honest when we speak with God. My son is learning judo. Every Sunday, he goes for judo class. And as, the, as one of the youngest in the class with only a white belt, he will often spar with someone who is taller than him, stronger than him, and more skillful than he is. So I'll remember, every week I'll watch him, and he will be slammed to the floor every single time. I mean, that's what judo is like, right? You get slammed to the floor. And I'll remember how he will pick himself up after he's being slammed to the floor he would fight back tears. He would muster up his courage and then he would go on and face his fears again. And every time that happened, my son would make eye contact with me. And then when the lesson ended, we would speak about his experience in the car. Almost every week, he would tell me, Papa, I don't want to do judo anymore. I would listen to all his fears. I will listen to all his worries because I know that this is part of the growth process for him. And then, before we drive off or while before we arrive home, I'll tell him, I'll comfort him, and I'll encourage him to try again next week. So after he wipes away some tears, he will say to me, okay, Papa, I will try my best. 
I'll give him a hug and a kiss, and then we'll share a cup of ice Milo together. You know, honestly, I can't do much. I can't barge into the judo place and slam his opponent for him, right? I can't do that. All I could do is I could smile at him, I could nod at him, and when he makes eye contact with me, I'll give him a thumbs up. When the sparring was over, I will commend him for facing his fears, for overcoming it. My friends, our God is a loving Father. We can bring our fears to a loving Father. When we face adversity, we can ask God for courage. When we struggle to deal with the outcome of our fears, we can ask God to help us. God can handle our greatest fears. He can definitely handle it. So why don't you turn to someone beside you and tell that person, God can handle your greatest fears. For those of you who are online, type in, God can. God can. So remember, when we acknowledge our fears before God, it is a good first step for us in submitting to the will of God despite facing agony. Point number two, choose God's will over your own will. Choose God's will over your own will. You see, over here, Luke, the author, he hinted at a cosmic battle that was taking place in the unseen realm throughout this chapter. You can see that in verse 3 and verse 20, 31 of chapter 22, when he mentioned um, Satan's involvement with Judas and Peter, respectively. Now, watch how Jesus prayed. He said, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And it shows us here how Jesus ultimately surrendered his own will and submitted to God's will. To be frank, we don't really think about it, but this is an extremely difficult prayer posture that not many of us can adopt unless we have supernatural help. So when Jesus prayed that prayer, how did God respond to Jesus' earnest prayer? It wasn't to remove the cup, but it was to provide strength for the coming ordeal. You see, friends, sometimes we experience being disillusioned with God or being disappointed with God because we either ask God for the wrong thing or we don't want to accept the way God answers our prayer. Here's the thing about prayer. We know that God listens to all our prayers. But here's the other thing about prayer. We don't know how God will respond to it. We don't know when God will respond to it. What if God's response to you, to your prayer, was to say, no, son? What if God's response to your prayer was, wait, daughter? Or what if God's response to you was to simply say, stay silent, because he wants to teach you something in that time of waiting? Is God obliged to say yes to everything that we ask for? If we expect God to say yes to everything that we ask for, it simply makes us entitled sport brats. And it makes God an enabling father who gets pushed around and bullied. Remember, my friends, we are not praying to a genie who doesn't know anything. We, so if the genie doesn't know anything, we end up telling the genie what we want. No, we're not praying to a genie like that. We are praying to a God who knows better than we do. We are praying to a God who knows better. Therefore, instead of telling Him what we want, we should ask Him, God, what do you want for my life? So in this scene in the Garden of Gethsemane, how did God respond to Jesus' request of saying, if you are willing, remove this cup from me? Now you see, Luke mentioned that there was angelic intervention. So we can see that God responded to Jesus' prayer by sending an angel to strengthen him. Friends, if Jesus, being fully God, needed supernatural intervention, what more us when we go through agony? Here's the irony. Humanly speaking, Jesus was kind of in a loose-loose situation. If he had embraced the cup and obeyed what God divinely purposed, purpose for him to do by going to suffer and die on the cross, he was in effect accepting the fate that Satan had willed for him. Satan looked like he won. When Jesus went to the cross, it looked like Satan got what he wanted. Jesus, the promised Messiah, died. 
But you see, it's not like that from the divine perspective. Unlike Satan who only knows some things, God knows everything. And unlike God, Satan did not know how the story would end. Later on, it becomes clear that Jesus' death on the cross represents not only the greatest of the devil's achievements, but actually the devil's ultimate demise. Because Jesus went to the cross and defeated death, you and I may have life with God. Amen? You see, God clearly knows better. So friends, what do we do when we make our requests to God? What do we know? The only thing that we should know is that God always knows better. And when Jesus was strengthened, his prayer intensified despite his agony. And you notice how Jesus responded after he was strengthened. In his agony, he was now being portrayed like an athlete. He was so earnestly engaged in this divine contest that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. What Luke was emphasizing here was that when Jesus was up against the forces of darkness, he knew that it wouldn't be an easy battle. It would be a contest. And he had to press on in prayer and fight in this supernatural battle. Luke also stressed here that the outcome of Jesus' battle wasn't in the hands of the devil, but it was in the hands of the Father. Jesus could withstand this agony because in his prayer, and don't miss this, in his prayer, he chose God's will over his own will. That's why he could withstand the agony. Gracious, how will you choose God's will unless you know God's will? There are many ways for us to know God's will and prayer is a very good starting point. In, pray in prayer, you will realize what your rightful response to God's will should be. In prayer, you get to align yourself to God's purpose for your life. You see, sometimes choosing God's will over our own will is hard, especially when we don't agree with God's will, right? But you know, sometimes it's also hard even if you agree with God's will. What God intends for us to do is sometimes different from what we want to do ourselves. And many times, choosing God's will over your own and struggling through it is part of your discipleship journey to know God. So why don't you put your hand in your heart and you tell yourself, Lord, teach me to choose your will over my own will. And for those online, type in your will. Now let me unpack our last learning point in how to submit to the will of God despite facing agony. Point three, resolve to live out God's will when others don't. Resolve to live out God's will when others don't. After he came back from his secret place to pray, Jesus returned to find his disciples asleep. And then he urged them to, avoid, to, to pray so that they may avoid temptation. You see, the disciples at the fringes during Jesus' prayer struggle and their failure to pray, it contrasted against Jesus' actions in earnest prayer. The sobering reality here is that not everyone will understand your agony. The disciples certainly didn't understand Jesus' agony. My friends, there are three types of suffering. First, you suffer because others did wrong to you. Second, you suffer because you did something wrong. And third, you suffer because you are doing something right. Let us not be afraid of the third kind of suffering. The suffering that's caused by a conscious submission to God's will so that we may stay faithful in Him. You know, oftentimes we are tempted to not submit to God's will because we want to take the easier path. And that's what the disciples were tempted to do. And that's why they had to pray that they may not be tempted to do that, to take the easier path. So, so you and I, we need to pray against taking the easier path that is not God's will for us. And our choice is simple. It's whether we want to submit to God's will and all its repercussions, or we don't. When we make the right choice to submit to God's will, we need God's strength. To keep up with this right choice, we need God's strength. And this strength 
comes from God through prayer. You see, nobody except Jesus knew the motivation of the approaching crowd in verse 47. Imagine Jesus' frame of mind when he saw Judas and the mob coming after him. If he had not gone to God in prayer and surrendered and resolved to live out God's will, maybe he would have felt differently when Judas and his gang came to Jesus. Apart from any other source of information other than prophetic insight, only Jesus knew why Judas and the Jewish officials had come. Let us not forget that Jesus faced betrayal from someone in his inner circle. And oftentimes, the closer the betrayer is, the deeper the hurt will be. Perhaps this is something that some of us here have experienced before. The closer someone is to you, the more you've poured out yourself into his or her life, and the longer the time you spend together, experiencing betrayal from such a person usually results in a hurt like no other. I wonder how Jesus felt when he saw Judas and gang approaching him. Verse 47 commends the time of trial that Jesus had anticipated. His prayer struggle in Gethsemane prepared him for this very encounter. In the face of such difficulty, will you and I still resolve to follow God's will? You see, following God's will doesn't exempt you from pain, from hurt, or from betrayal. Is your resolve to live out God's will able to withstand such agony? And despite the deep betrayal from someone so close to him, Jesus still resolved to live out God's will even when Judas had chosen his own will. My friends, prayer doesn't exempt you from the coming trials, but it prepares you better to face it. Prayer doesn't exempt you from the coming trials, but it prepares you better to face it. Therefore, let us commit to living in a way that is worthy of what God has called us to do. The Apostle Paul described Jesus' submission in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, And being in human form, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And that is full-blown obedience. What a way for us on Palm Sunday to approach our Good Friday service. I believe that most of us here would not take the sacrifice of Jesus for granted. But I also suspect that some of us may have overlooked how difficult it was to submit to God's will over our own will. I believe that some of us here may have overlooked how difficult it was for Jesus to submit to God's will over his own will. But yet Jesus submitted to the will of God despite facing agony. What about us? Are we able to submit to the will of God when we face agony? At this point in time, I would like to ask the worship team to return. I remember how agonizingly difficult it was for me to face my fears before I became a father for the first time. When my wife Hui was pregnant with Eden, my firstborn, I had irrational thoughts about the well-being and development of my unborn child. I don't know, maybe some first-time parents would have experienced that before. And because my wife was the one carrying the baby, I didn't want to share my irrational thoughts with her. I was afraid that me sharing my thoughts with her will affect her directly, and maybe it will affect my daughter's, my unborn daughter's development indirectly. Irrational thoughts. Maybe this is a first-time parent issue. Maybe this is spiritual immaturity. Or maybe this is just a deep-seated fear that I've never articulated to anyone and never articulated to God before. My friends, I've tried to pray away. Oh, many times, God, take this irrational thought away from me. I don't like what I'm feeling. God, take it away. But these irrational thoughts keep consuming me. And I'll get triggered by anything that I read or I watch online that was related to pregnancy risks. It was so dilapidating 
that I even rejected prayer from a well-meaning pastor who came to me and knew that my wife was pregnant and he said, Joey, 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 I have a word for you, for your child. I said to that pastor, don't want, don't want, don't want. I don't want to hear this word away from me. I was afraid of what I would hear. I couldn't deal with the what-ifs. These unfounded fears, they put me in agony. And these fears, it came to a climax when a Gratian invited me to watch a movie with him. Lesson learned, don't anyhow watch movies. Now in this show, the main character's son died in a riot. And so in the movie, in the funeral scene, the camera zoomed in to the tombstone. And the date on the tombstone was 3rd April. And this 3rd April was the estimated delivery date of my firstborn. I kid you not. My senses went into overdrive. I was frozen with fear in the movie theatre. And as soon as the movie ended, I told my friend I wasn't feeling well and I wanted to go home immediately. While driving home, I remember I was about to turn into AYE. I suffered a panic attack. My chest tightened and I struggled to breathe. All I knew how, what to do was to pray in the spirit. So I did that while driving. I didn't sweat blood, but I was in cold sweat. I told God that I was afraid. I was afraid of the outcome. I was afraid of what I just saw in the movie theatre. I acknowledged my fears before God. It didn't make sense to me at all. But God could deal with my senseless situation. I asked God to remove my anxieties about the future. I asked God to remove my worries about the unknown. And then in that car, I surrendered the outcome to Him. I didn't call my wife, of course, because I didn't want to explain to her the current state that I'm in. Instead, my SOS was to call my marriage mentors. They prayed with me immediately and it was nearly midnight and instead of them returning to bed, they came out and they met me halfway home. Then they took over my car and they drove me to safety, drove me home safely. God sent them like angels to strengthen me in my hour of crisis. Then on my behalf, they called Hui and just simply explained to my wife that your husband is unwell, he had a long day, can you please help him into bed? He didn't want to call you because you're pregnant and it's nearly midnight, so they, he called us instead. <laughs> and then Hui helped me to settle into bed. Those hours after midnight, it felt like a blur. I remember surrendering my deepest fears to God. I remember sleeping that night with the deathly feeling lifted. And I remember waking the next morning with an indescribable peace. And then, that's where I found a deep resolve for fatherhood and a deep commitment to raise my firstborn regardless of what may come. I felt this sense of conviction and certainty and God had prepared me for the road ahead. Perhaps something happened that night in the unseen realm that neither my mentors nor I knew about. All we knew to do was to engage in a contest. And fast forward to Eden's birthday, not on 3rd April, but on 18 March last Monday. She celebrated 10 years on earth. Eden was born whole and healthy by God's grace. And for those of you who remember what it was like to be in the delivery ward, the midwife will come to me and say, count the fingers. And I will count. One, two, three, four, five, ten. All there. Count the toes. One, two, three, four, five. All there. And the midwife will look at me. Good. I only told Hui Yi what happened that night after a confinement period none of the fears I had about my unborn child came to pass. In that first pregnancy journey, I acknowledged my fears. 
I found my resolve. I chose God's will and I found my resolve to live out God's will. And then I received God's peace. That contest that night wasn't easy for me, but I couldn't have imagined not praying in the Spirit or bringing my fears to God and trusting Him. Patience. Good Friday is good because Jesus submitted to the will of God despite facing the agony that He did in the garden. He chose God's will over His own will and He resolved to live it out. The first temptation He faced was in the wilderness and the last He faced was in the garden. In this garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was undoing the consequences of Adam's choice to follow his own will in the garden of Eden. In the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus submitted to the will of God despite facing agony. With all eyes closed, with all heads bowed, Church, I want you to know that later on the altars will be open. And there's some of us here who need to have a conversation with the Lord. There are some of us here who need to bring our fears before God. Whether they are sensible to you or senseless to you, God can deal with it. You are bringing your fears before a God who knows better. The two groups of people I want to speak with. The first group are those who maybe are going through a difficult situation and you have not been completely open or honest with God about your current fear and struggle. Maybe you're afraid to reveal your true feelings to God. Maybe you have a wrong view of God, a wrong view of yourself, or maybe even a wrong perspective of your circumstances. But today, it's a good opportunity to pour out yourself to God and to be honest with Him. When the altars open, I want you to come forward so that we may pray with you. So if that is you, you're saying, Pastor, you're talking about me, I need to have a conversation with the Lord. I need to go to God. If that is you, would you raise your hand in acknowledgement of your fear to God? If that is you, you're saying, God, I need to have a conversation with you. I need to bring my fear before you. If that is you, would you just quickly slip up your hand? I want to acknowledge you. Thank you. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand at the back. I see your hand in the center. I see your hand at the back there. I see your hand in the gallery as well. Thank you. I see your hand in the front. We're going to wait a while. The Lord can handle your fears. The Lord can handle your deepest fears. And today you know you need to bring it before the Lord. Whatever you're going through, you want to bring it to the Lord. And you're saying, Pastor, would you pray for me as I bring it to the Lord? Would you raise your hand to the Lord, please? Thank you. I see your hand aside. The second group of people I want to speak with are those who are currently going through a tough time. And this tough time is very specific. It's because you have an intention to submit to the will of God. It's tough. Either you agree or disagree with it, it's tough. But you know that, that God, that's God's will for you and you want to stay obedient. It could be an agonizing time at work. It could be an agonizing time in school for those of you who are still in school or it could even be a relationship with a loved one that's filled with tension but you know God's will and you want to surrender to God's will and today you're saying God give me strength sustain me as I submit to your will God I want to remain steadfast in living out your calling in my life even if it costs me dearly God 
strengthen me, help me, comfort me, give me peace. If that is you, would you raise your hand to the Lord? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Many hands, many hands are raised. Thank you. In the gallery as well, if that is you, you're saying, God, strengthen me in my time of agony. I need to hear from you. I need to be touched by you, Lord. If that is you, would you raise your hand to the Lord? Thank you, I see your hand. Thank you, I see your hands in front. Thank you, I see your hand at the side. Church, shall we all stand to our feet? As Pastor Vic leads us in a song of response, I want to encourage all those who have lifted their hands and anyone, even if you have not lifted your hand, but you want to interact, you want to engage, you want to have an exchange with the Lord at the altar, I want to invite you to quickly make your way to the altar right now. Let us pray together with you. Come church, let's respond to the Lord. The altars are open. Let's step forward. So now and under your wings cover me within if you're a leader would you come like wise to just pray for the people the altar leaders who when just the oceans rise the rest of us come forward God has spoken to you don't miss out the opportunity what God can do in your life I'm so with you come to my left let's come to the left come forward small. Father you are king over the flood the altar is still open receive and time I will be come still, and meet God come and encounter God right here God. thank you Lord Find rest, my soul, find rest, my soul, in Christ alone, in Christ alone, and know His power. Yeah, keep coming, keep coming. Leaders, if you are here, would you come and pray for our fellow Christians? Come and stand on our side with them on my left. Your yeah, people can escape just me. Hallelujah. And I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. And I will be still, know you are God.
Though you are God. 